So we sit here and meditate. We're engaged in a type of karma. It's called the karma that puts an end to karma. And this doesn't mean that it burns away old karma. Old karma doesn't burn. It's one of the great ironies of the history of Buddhism, is that teachings that the Buddha explicitly attacked are nowadays attributed to the Buddha himself. One of them is the idea that simply by learning how not to react to anything in the present moment, you're not creating any new sankharas, and, by, and you're also burning away old sankharas, old karma. But there's a passage where the, the Buddha actually attacks the idea that you can burn off old karma. In fact, he gets quite satirical about it. He goes to see some Jains who believe that they could burn off old karma by submitting themselves to different kinds of austerities, and that the pain of the austerity was the the burning of the karma. He said, can you measure how much karma you burned today, how much karma you burned yesterday? Do you actually see the karma burning? Of course, the answer is no. And they said, well, this is just the old karma coming up. And, well, he said, have you noticed that when you don't do your austerities, the, there's no pain? He's making the point that when you experience karma, it's not just past karma, it's also our present decisions. And this is the part of meditation that's really important. It's our present decisions, what we're going to do with the mind, what we're going to focus on, how we develop it. That's the karma of the meditation. So you want to focus on things to help you understand what's going on in the mind. What is this process of intention? How does the mind create an experience of pleasure? How does it create an experience of pain out of the raw material of old karma? This is why right view is at the beginning of the path. On the one hand, understanding that our actions are important, and particularly that it's the intention in the action that makes all the difference, which means that issues of karma are issues of the mind. You will look into the mind to see what's actually going on, to see where you add the element of stress that you don't have to. The Buddha, can't, the Buddha located it in craving. Specifically, three types of craving. Craving for sensuality. And your sensuality doesn't necessarily mean sensual pleasures. He's, he actually makes the point. It's our intentions for sensuality that we're really attached to. The idea of sensual pleasure is a lot more attractive than the actual pleasure itself. Because you think about it over and over and over again, whereas the actual pleasure, once you've experienced it, is gone. And they have to find another one to replace it. So it's our craving for sensuality, this tendency of the mind to keep thinking about, planning about how it's going to experience different sensual pleasures. We're really attached to that. We really cling to that. That's one kind of craving. Then there's the craving to become something, in other words, to take on an identity in a specific world of experience. The identity, the identity often plays into the world, the world plays into the identity. In other words, whichever world you're thinking about right now will, that, will then determine the kind of identity you want to take in that world. And we crave these things. We feel diminished if we aren't able to assume an identity in a particular world that we think is important or interesting or attractive. And there's craving for non-becoming. In other words, to destroy whatever identity you've, you've had, whatever world you've been experiencing. These three types of craving, that's where the suffering gets added. 
You know, it's often assumed that you go beyond these three types of craving simply by learning how to be non-reactive. But I haven't seen non-reactivity or right non-reactivity as any of the factors of the path. The qualities you develop and qualities you abandon. Look, we're trying to develop mindfulness right now. This is sometimes where the non-reactivity gets inserted in the path. But the Buddha never defined mindfulness as non-reactivity. It's the ability to keep something in mind. And then he gives you four frames of reference that you can keep in mind as a basis for right concentration. Now, when he teaches concentration, he does start out with equanimity as a prerequisite. He teaches Rahula, breath meditation. Because first you want to make your mind like earth. When disgusting things are thrown in the earth, the earth doesn't react. So here would be a, an element of non-reactivity. But it's for the purpose of getting the mind ready to be in concentration on the breath. You make your mind like water. Water doesn't get disgusted when it has to wash away disgusting things. Fire doesn't get disgusted when it burns disgusting things. The wind doesn't get disgusted when it blows disgusting things. You try to make your mind like the elements. But the purpose here is that you want to make your mind or put your mind in a position where it can observe things clearly. Because when you start breath meditation, you're not just looking at the breath in a non-reactive way. The Buddha once recommended to the monks that they practice breath meditation. One of the monks said, well, I already do that. And the Buddha asked him, well, what kind of breath meditation do you practice? He says, well, I learn how not to hanker after the past, not to hanker after the future, and to be equanimous toward the present as I breathe in, as I breathe out. And then the Buddha said, well, there is that kind of breath meditation, but that's not how you get the most out of breath meditation. And then he goes into the 16 steps as the way that you do get the most out of breath meditation. And there's a lot of willing and there's a lot of training of the mind, developing certain qualities. You don't just sit here and watch whatever breath comes up willy-nilly, or pretend that you're not having any intentional role in shaping the breath. You're actually exploring that intentional role, first by being where the whole body as you breathe in, breathe out, then calming the breath, calming the effect that the breathing has on the body, calming the intentional element that goes into the breath to make it more and more refined, so you can give rise to a sense of ease, rapture. And then you notice how those feelings of ease and rapture have an impact on the mind, then how your perception of the breath is having an impact on the mind, and then you try to calm that impact. And then you see what the mind needs. Does it need to be gladdened? Does it need to be steadied? Does it need to be released from anything that it's holding on to? How do you breathe in a way that helps accomplish that? These are all things you do with the breath, things that you do with the mind. And the equanimity here is simply allowing you to observe clearly what's happening so you can do these things more effectively. You're basically using the breath to feed the mind. This is one of the underlying images throughout the Buddhist teachings, that the mind is hungry. This is why we suffer. We're hungry for form, feeling, perceptions, thought fabrications, consciousness. And this is why we suffer. The word upadana for clinging also means to take sustenance from something. In other words, you feed on it, and it's because we feed that we suffer. Now, the Buddha doesn't say, well, simply stop feeding because there's no really good food out there. That would be a very defeatist kind of teaching. It wouldn't be very effective. He says, okay, you're hungry, but you learn how not to be hungry by realizing there's no good food. That doesn't work with the body, and it certainly doesn't work with the mind.
Now, there's no way that you could ever put the body in a position where it would be totally free from hunger, but you can do that with the mind. And it's not simply by learning how to accept things as unsatisfactory. You feed the mind with good qualities that you develop. You work on your conviction, your persistence, concentration, mindfulness, concentration, discernment. These are the qualities that you develop on the path that strengthen the mind. And it's through the, the discernment, understanding what you're doing, the results of what you're doing, seeing where the unnecessary stress is in all of this. So you let go of whatever activities are causing that unnecessary stress. And in the course of doing that, you run across something unexpected. As you let go of your attachments, you find that the, the mind really can touch something that's deathless. The Buddha calls it seeing with the body or touching it with the body. In other words, it's a total experience. It's not just an idea. It totally replaces your experience of the body, and it totally satisfies your hunger. You first have experience of it at stream entry, you realize, okay, this would satisfy hunger. And it's the arahant who's totally satisfied, the person who's ended his or her hunger. And from that point on can be equanimous about whatever arises at the eye, the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, or the mind. Not because he or she has become defeatist and says, well, there's really no happiness to be found there, so I just might as well give up. It's because he or she, the Arahant, has no more hunger. The hunger has been satisfied. The mind no longer feels any need to eat at all, to feed on anything at all. And that's why you can be equanimous toward these other things. In the past, that's where you looked for your food. Now you found a much better source of food. So you don't have to feed on the old foods anymore. But to get there requires a lot of mindfulness, a lot of concentration that can enable your discernment to see these things. Because the deathless is available at any time. But our discernment is not refined enough, not precise enough to detect it. It has to be trained. This is why the path is a gradual one. But it does have its turning points. This is why the Buddha's image is of the continental shelf off of India. A gradual slope and then a sudden drop. The sudden drop is when you detect the deathless. It's a sudden, total experience. And there's a lot of comprehension that goes along with that. You know immediately, this is deathless. This is something that time can't touch, because it's outside of time. So the comprehension is instantaneous. We work toward it by gradually refining our discernment. But when it, when it reaches that point, the comprehension goes very deep, very suddenly. and gives a lot of satisfaction. That's why the Arahant no longer hungers. Now, the Arahant hasn't burned off any past karma, but relates to past karma in a very different way. Whatever comes up, In the past, and there can still be a lot of negative stuff 
the arahant's experience. In the case of Moggallana, who was beaten again and again and again before he finally died. He realized it was the result of some past lifetime where he'd killed his parents. But his mind wasn't harmed by this mind, wasn't hurt by it, because he didn't create any suffering out of it. As the Buddha said at one point, it's to making the mind limitless that you can greatly minimize the impact of any past bad karma. Limitless in terms of the, the Brahma Viharas. Limitless goodwill, limitless compassion, limitless empathetic joy, limitless equanimity. And then also what's called training the body, training the mind. In other words, learning how to keep the mind from being overcome by pleasure, overcome by pain. We work on that, work on that in a gradual way by providing other places for the mind to stay. In other words, you. When there's pain in one part of the body, you can stay with the comfortable sensations you develop through concentration in another part of the body. And you can will yourself, to some extent, not to be overcome by these things. That willing is impermanent. It doesn't totally solve the problem. It's when you've reached the deathless that you have another source of pleasure that totally overwhelms the experience of pleasure and pain, it keeps you from being overwhelmed by ordinary pleasure or pain. So on the outside it looks like nirvana is simply equanimity, and there's a lot of misunderstanding about that, but it's not. One of the results of nirvana is that you can be equanimous towards the six senses. But as the Buddha said, nirvana is the ultimate happiness. It doesn't say it's the ultimate equanimity, it's the ultimate happiness. The arahant no longer hungers, because he or she is totally satisfied with that happiness. And at that point, karma is ended. They say that the arahant continues to have intentions, but the intention becomes like a seed. And this is the only place where the Buddha talks about burning the intention. He says it's like taking a seed and then immediately burning it so it doesn't sprout into anything else. How that happens, you'd have to be an arahant to know. But the only way you can do that is by really understanding what you're doing right now, understanding karma. You can't learn how to have intentions that don't sprout until you've learned how your intentions do sprout. This is what we're doing as we practice meditation. We're trying to plant good intentions and then watch how they sprout. And they'll get more and more refined intentions, so they give more and more refined sprouts. We've got a greater refinement and understanding of how karma actually happens. So when you finally see through it, that's when you know how to do it, but without having it sprout. So you can't simply will yourself to be non-reactive and hope that take, that takes care of everything, or even think that it's somehow burning off karma, because of course the willing to be non-reactive is a kind of karma itself. The willing here is to try to do the meditation, develop right mindfulness, develop right concentration as skillfully as possible. And in developing the skill, you learn, you gain a lot of discernment. The things you know most clearly are the things that you do yourself. So you want to learn how to do this really, really skillfully, so you understand it through and through. You comprehend it to the point where you develop dispassion for it, and when in developing dispassion, that's when you stop. You 
you know how to stop because you know what you've been doing. So this is how the karma of the path leads to the end of karma. It teaches you to understand karma so thoroughly that you can plant seeds that don't sprout. You don't have to suffer from your past karma, you're not suffering from present karma. The mind is no longer hungry, so it doesn't feed on its karma, past or present. Because it's found the happiness that eliminates any further need to feed. <laughs>